Morning, Mr. Brown. Mo morning, Porsche. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? All right. Sorry, man. I was just doing some other work in the meantime. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. All right. I'm, All right. I'm the, the flight stops, man. Yes, please, may you remember to submit it to Johnny or to to Nipsey. They will, uh, they will forward it on to, I don't know, there's somebody that deals with that stuff. Uh, yes, at I finance. do just now. Oh, okay, cool. waiting. Yeah. So no, that's good. All right, we'll chat later. All right. <clears throat>
Morning, Chairperson. Morning, members, uh, members of officials from the department, Deputy Minister. Okay, can you hear me? Morning, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Morning, Llewellyn. Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay, Chair. We have we have five members currently with us. But can we give it another minute or two? It's fine. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm already here, Chair. <laughs> I'm just announcing myself, please. Just that. Hey, Ben, it's here. <laughs> I didn't want that. You can get a massive challenge out in him, George. Sad. No, but right, Rakulu, Chaperson, thank you very much. All right, okay. It's very cold. Yeah, no, yo, it's cold everywhere. It's cold everywhere, yes. Yeah. No, thanks very much, Chair. Eh? All right, good morning. Chairperson, uh, uh, Mr. Wellen, uh, yeah, I think we have seven members uh, present. Uh, we have, I know we have three apologies, Chairperson. Um, I'm sure if you want, Chair, I can hand over to you to start the meeting. So, Mr. Brown, we are also present. 
Honorable uh, Mashabella, I have all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Llewellyn. And let us greet everybody that is in the meeting. Um, I believe the department is led by the Director General. We are greeting DG. Uh, it's led by the Deputy Minister. Recording Chair, in sorry. progress. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. No, my apologies, oh, dear. Oh. I thought that you are you are not in the meeting. Um, let me greet the members and um, our support staff as well. And I know we've got says as well in the in the meeting. Um, hope we are still enjoying Women's Month. As 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 women, we are putting a group today is a significance of our womanhood. Um, this is the third term. Um, we're in the third term and we will be working for about six weeks um, for this term before we move to another constituency period. And we are having um, a presentation on the gender-based violence today. Um, which is, is very important um, as it speaks to this month as well. And I must mention that um, says they are, um, their council's term is also, has also come to an end. As a result, um, they have invited us as the committee um, to their um, farewell function, which will be tomorrow. I think uh, Llewellyn will send to all members the, the link so that members can join uh, if they are, they are interested to. But I must say that we had a very interesting and very successful oversight last week um, in KZN and Gauteng. So we are still um, tired from the, from the oversight, which uh, we, we must mention that it was, um, it was interesting uh, and very, very exciting oversight that we went to in the cold um, weather in, in both provinces. Now, without wasting time, Llewellyn, any apologies? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'll, I'll just go through the, the roll call. It's yourself, Honorable Ingo Gigaba. I have Honorable Adwins, Honorable Siwela. Uh, I have Honorable Nwadada, Honorable Van der Valt. I have Honorable Tembe, Dr. Tembe Kwayo and Honorable Nwadada uh, present. The apologies I've received is for Honorable Morwa Chechla. He's busy traveling down to Cape Town and he will try and link up with us uh, where and if he's able. I also have an apology from Honorable Yabo and, uh, and an apology from Honorable Sukers, who is currently in Oatsville. And uh, we have received an apology from the Minister Chairperson. She is due for an NCCC meeting this morning at the same time. I also see that Honorable uh, Malachi has also joined us. Thank you, Chairperson. But All I right. didn't hear my name, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, Honorable Brown. Mashabella. Please, Mr. Brown, we don't start so early in the morning. It's very cold. <laughs> oh, Apologies. Uh, uh, noted, uh, Honorable Mashabella. Um, members on the agenda, we are having, can you flag the agenda, Honorable, I mean, Mr. Brown? <clears throat> on the agenda, we are having the, the, the briefing by the, by the department uh, on gender-based programs as implemented in the, in their sector. And we will also be briefed by SAIS on sexual gender-based violence in teaching profession. So we're having those two presentation um, today. Can I have um, a, a, a mover and a second for the agenda? Anyone to adopt the agenda? Chairperson, uh, it's honorable I noble. Yes, uh, I, I, yes. I, I wanted to uh, move uh, that we adopt the agenda as it appears. Thank Seven you. Any second at once? 
I second chair, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. Morning, morning, sis. Um, DM, can I hand over to you to do a political overview? And then immediately after yourself, uh, you can hand over to whoever that must uh, do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, chair. Uh, and good morning to all the colleagues in the meeting. And we thank the portfolio committee for inviting the department to come and brief them on issues of sexual harassment in schools and misconduct by educators. That's why we have Cece here, who's also going to present. Chair, the, the DG is in the meeting. Uh, the Cece is in the meeting. Dr. Whittle, I suppose, is in the meeting. So the team from basic education, uh, is in the meeting, except the apology that was said by uh, the minister that is, she's attending the NCCC meeting. Chair, issues of gender-based violence, sexual harassment are issues that are in the communities. And uh, anything that is happening in the community will of course come to schools because we always say that the, the school is a microcosm of the community. So, but be as it may, we still have programs to deal with sexual harassment, programs to deal with gender-based violence and femicide in schools. That sometimes what we, people might think that we are not dealing with these matters is when there's, there's a sexual harassment case and the minor, the child, sometimes, when the matter crops up, then it becomes, we all become so alarmed. And the, 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 the child, if the child changes the statement, and yet the people remain that this teacher has sexually harassed, harassed this child. And now the child said, uh -uh, it didn't happen. And we all expect that teacher to be punished or to follow all the, the, the processes. But if now the, the, what do we call them, the affected, because the teacher will be called the, uh, the whatever, then if the person who is directly affected says no, then <laughs> the case falls off. <laughs> that is the unfortunate situation when the victim does not stand up or is afraid or has been threatened by the same perpetrator, it becomes a, a challenge to conclude that case in a way that will satisfy the society. And that's what even says is experiencing, but we are doing all what it takes to make sure that we bring awareness to all our teachers because we need them. We're not pleased to expel a teacher because of sexual harassment. So we, work with them, conscientize them about the consequences, work with the learners, uh, conscientize them to respect each one's body. That's what we normally do. But the presentation will tell us exactly what are the programs in place uh, that to deal with uh, sexual harassment and also the misconduct by teachers if they embark on that. So Chair, let me not waste much time and give straight to give it to the DG to lead and facilitate in terms of the presentations. Then we'll come to you when we have presented the last presentation of the two. Thank you so much, Chair. Over to you, DG. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable DM, Honorable Chair, and Honorable Members. Uh, indeed, we want to applaud your committee, Chair, for having called us to come and account on what the President calls, calls the second pandemic in the country, gender-based violence. We are also battling with this in our schools. As somebody said at some point, uh, I think it's the, the whip, that uh, this is a pandemic that's bigger than uh, uh, sectors. It's endemic in the entire uh, society. 
Chair, the presentation is going to be made by two colleagues. In our meeting of uh, last week Friday, we agreed at senior management that Dr. Whittle will lead this presentation. It transcends branches. It will reflect how in the department we are dealing with gen gender-based violence. Dr. Whittle's branch drives uh, uh, dealing with gender-based violence in the main in schools. We will also look at the 75 districts, how we are dealing with gender-based violence. We will look at the leadership of the deputy minister in particular, how the deputy minister is leading the sector in dealing with gender-based violence. And if you allow, Chair, uh, lastly, uh, SACE will come in as our entity, the South African uh, Council for Educators, to indicate how they are dealing with gender-based violence. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring the ELRC in. The ELRC is also dealing uh, with gender-based violence. We work quite closely with them. Uh, but I'm going to request, uh, in the interest of time, Dr. Whittle to come and take us through a very comprehensive presentation informed by not less than four branches in the department and then says uh, will follow immediately thereafter, if you allow, Chair. Uh, Dr. Whittle? Uh, thank you very much, DG. Uh, good morning to the Deputy Minister, Honourable Chairperson, Honourable Members of the Committee. Um, it is quite a lengthy presentation, so I'll try and, and move as, as quickly as I can. Um, this is the outline of the presentation. We were asked specifically to uh, report on the gender responsive framework, uh, GBV programs that we're running in the country, uh, an update on the girls and boys education movement, and then how we are dealing with sexual harassment uh, in our schools, and that's where SACE will come in as well. Next one. So just by way of the purpose uh, is, is to, to cover all of those areas that I've just mentioned. It's fine, Livo, to the next one. <clears throat> and just by way of background, uh, Chairperson, uh, so the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disability presented the, uh, the framework to, uh, to broad management in the department uh, in October 2020. The, the purpose of the framework um, is to uh, achieve the constitutional vision of a non-sexist uh, and society and gender equality uh, more broadly to ensure women's empowerment is placed at the center of public policy making, planning and budgeting, and the adequate resource allocation to improve the country's performance on gender equality and women's emancipation, uh, to promote inclusive growth and development and achieve the, the country's development uh, goals. The implementation plan of the framework was formally adopted by cabinet in, 20, in 2019. So in response to this uh, briefing that we got from the Department of, of Women, uh, Youth and, and, and People with Disabilities, the DBE then established a, a task team. Uh, the aim of that task team is to steer the implementation of the gender responsive framework, um, but also to implement, monitor and evaluate uh, the implementation of the national strategic plan on gender-based violence. As DG has indicated, the, the task team is led by the Office of the Director General, and it's supported by uh, the Care and Support branch, branch that provides a gender lens uh, for this work. Next one. So in terms of the implementation of our programs directly in the districts, uh, the department has established an action group. That action group uh, coordinates work uh, across government, uh, working with, with SAPS as well as other government departments. It's supported by our development partners like uh, GIZ, the German Development Corporation, as well as UNICEF. And then we work with a range of social, uh, with, with uh, civil society partners um, that also work with us in terms of ensuring the safety of learners, particularly during the period of COVID, and with a particular focus on gender-based violence. Next one. <clears throat> so the girls 
and boys education movement is a is a uh, a learner participation movement that we've done probably for the last 10 years in partnership with with unicef uh, the aim is to encourage girls and boys to work together uh, to foster human dignity and respect uh, you know across the sexes and to foster gender equality values in terms of promoting positive gender norms uh, the 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 gembem program uh, utilizes the can support for teaching and learning that we've come to present to the committee a couple of times already uh, as a framework to coordinate uh, the work that we do next one <clears throat> so in terms of policy and, and strategic frameworks i'm not going to spend too much time on this one but to indicate that in 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 government uh, the gender responsive framework is led by the department of women um, and we as South Africa have signed up as a pathfinder country uh, uh, where we use the INSPIRE framework to end violence against uh, children and adolescents. Uh, and there we work very closely with UNESCO. The policies that are listed there are some of the policies that we're utilizing for this work, the CAPS, the Integrated School Health Program, the revised national policy on HIV, STIs and TB, of course, the National School Safety Framework, um, there's a collective agreement that was signed, which is uh, why D just made reference to the LRC. Um, and then there's various internal policies that I'm sure uh, SACE will, will refer to as well. Next one. So there, there are some uh, additional policy uh, frameworks that we think uh, are important. The first one is a policy for the prevention and management of learner pregnancy in schools. This is a policy, a draft policy that we've widely consulted on with, with key stakeholders. Um, we've published it for public comment. We've now incorporated all of that, you know, all of those comments. And the policy is on its way to cabinet. We're hoping within the next month or two uh, that cabinet will approve that particular policy. It's, it's trying to deal with the high rates of, of teen pregnancies that we continue to have uh, in the country but also to encourage girls when they do fall pregnant to return to school. We are working again with UNICEF, uh, with the South African Human Rights Commission uh, and a few other uh, civil society partners to develop a protocol for the, for the elimination of unfair discrimination in schools. And again, as the committee would know, we've had various uh, incidents of discrimination from uh, Brackenfell High in, in the Western Cape to uh, Cornwall Hill in Gauteng, uh, some schools in Mpumalanga as well. And so this work obviously remains critical. Uh, and that's why we are uh, seeking to finalize this particular protocol. Then we're also working with a range of, of civil society partners uh, to finalize guidelines for the educational and, and social inclusion of LTBGIQ children and uh, to, to deal specifically with their issues uh, in schools also to deal uh, with issues of protection for them. Next one. So in terms of the prevention approaches that we that we utilize, and I'll speak to each one of these in turn, uh, but the curriculum and assessment implementation, learning and teaching support materials, teacher training, uh, co-curriculum and, and enrichment programs, as well as advocacy and information. Next one. So in terms of curriculum, if you can skip back uh, a little, in terms of curriculum, uh, we've got GBE, uh, GBV is addressed through the provision of uh, comprehensive sexuality education. Um, as part of this uh, curriculum focus, it uh, provides sexual and reproductive health services in secondary schools, and particularly has a focus on alcohol and drug use, as well as learner pregnancies. In primary schools, activities mainly focus on raising awareness of social justice and vulnerability, such as reporting of abuse and support for uh, GBV affected learners. I'm not gonna talk through all of these, but to, to indicate that in the foundation phase, there's really a focus on the safety of the body, uh, protecting pers personal space, and then of course reporting. In the intermediate phase, again, uh, bullying, sexual abuse, sexual grooming. And again, there's a big emphasis in the curriculum on reporting. Uh, in the senior phase, we introduce constructions of gender, of consent, of power, and control in relationships. And then, of course, in the FET phase, 
uh, we take these, we dig a little deeper in terms of gender construction, consent power, as well as assertive communication. Next one. So in terms of, of learning and teaching support materials, uh, in addition to the work books uh, for life skills in grades one to three, which we think are, are, are very good uh, LTSM uh, in terms of GBV, uh, we have now developed as the state uh, nine new state owned uh, life skills and life orientation textbooks. These are currently available in English and we're hoping uh, to have these in schools uh, by the beginning of next year. We've also developed a set of scripted lesson plans for the delivery of comprehensive sexuality education. And these have been piloted in, in 10 districts uh, of seven provinces. And of course, we're introducing uh, adolescent girl and young woman program in partnership with the Global Fund that takes this work forward. Next one. <clears throat> so in terms of teacher training and development, and this is obviously key, uh, again, there's reference to continued misconduct of, of teachers, which obviously makes this uh, work quite, quite critical. We are developing uh, life skills and life orientation teaching guides, and we will roll out a program of uh, training teachers on the utilization of those uh, life orientation textbooks. We finalized a teaching for all a tertiary academic project in partnership with the British Council. Uh, that is, we've started rolling out to 10 universities, and this specifically targets pre-service teacher training, so that the teachers that come into the system uh, have the values, uh, the, the, the attitudes that would allow them to come into the system and to promote, uh, you know, gender equity uh, policies within the system. We're also rolling out in partnership with VVOB, that is the international arm of the Belgian government, and the ETDP CETA a gender responsive pedagogy toolkit for early childhood education. And the, the purpose of this particular uh, uh, toolkit is to enable ECD practitioners uh, to deal uh, sensitively with issues of gender uh, in, in, in uh, ECD centers. We do know that children's gender identity and gender norms are formed by about six years of age. And so intervention in ECD is absolutely critical. In terms of co-curricular and enrichment programs uh, can support services, values are, are, are absolutely critical. And we have a specific focus on promoting constitutional values, uh, the Bill of Rights, and, and also for both uh, learners and teachers to understand the responsibilities that come with those rights. We have a very specific focus on gender empowerment and the, the gem BEMs play a, an, an important role here. And um, uh, just in terms of the, the, the work that we're doing with adolescent girls, there is a decision now because of high dropout rates of boys and boys falling behind uh, you know, with the education that going forward, there must also be a specific focus on the difficulties uh, and the issues that are affecting boys. Uh, sexual diversity and gender identity is a, you know, is a major focus of our work going forward uh, to end gender, uh, school-related gender-based violence. There's a number of, uh, uh, um, you, you know, uh, interventions that we have. The protocol for the management and reporting of uh, sexual abuse and harassment in schools is one where we are working cooperatively with SACE as well as with the, e, uh, you know, with the ELRC to ensure that when uh, issues of sexual abuse and harassment uh, are reported in schools that those are speedily uh, investigated and um, and uh, and finalized. Um, there's essential support services that we provide. If you just go back, uh, yeah, um, that we provide to orphan and vulnerable children. Uh, we do jamborees for future choices. We encourage uh, children to um, you know to make career choices, choose the correct subjects. Um, but also we, we provide them with the opportunity if they are in grade 12 to apply for NISFAS uh, so that girls uh, are able to access higher education as well. Uh, we, we run the Techno Girl program, which is a, a, a program that helps girls in particular uh, to access the STEM subjects and to take those through to, um, you know, to university. Next one. 
So advocacy is quite an important uh, aspect of this work. There's a range of, uh, of publications, manuals, uh, books uh, that we have done over the last uh, couple of years. These are available, they're listed there. Uh, and most of these have been distributed to all our schools, but they are available from us uh, at, at the national department as well. Next one. So Chair, just by way of an update uh, on the uh, gender responsive framework, um, as I've indicated already, we are expected to report in terms of the frame, uh, in terms of the framework to the Department of Women, uh, Youth and People with Disability. Our first report went in on the 15th of February. Uh, next one. This reporting has been quite difficult for the department. Uh, it's obviously a new uh, focus area within our work uh, that we have to periodically report in terms of the framework. Um, and branches have struggled to articulate the gender mainstreaming, you know, in terms of their programs. It's not just something that the DBE has struggled with. It's also other government departments. And we have asked the Treasury uh, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to uh, provide training to both DET, uh, DOH, uh, Department of Health, as well as DBE. Uh, and they have undertaken to support the DBE in terms of practical ways through which we can mainstream gender equity consistently in the programs uh, and also to provide this aggregated data, uh, including on uh, financial resources and budgeting. Next one. So this gives you a cross-cutting uh, overview of the themes for reporting. Uh, we all have to do five-year gender policy, uh, including priorities and programs, uh, this aggregated data uh, to show how we are promoting uh, gender equity, uh, but also through service delivery, uh, international uh, woman empowerment and, and, and gender equity is, is, is uh, at the basis of reporting. Of course, this has to be taken through in terms of legislation, in terms of implications for cabinet and for parliament, uh, how we do a gender equity in terms of our budgeting, in terms of auditing, and then of course, in terms of our national uh, evaluation system and policy. And all of these uh, reporting requirements are then pushed through the medium term strategic framework, our strategic plan of the five year strategic plan, and then of course the annual performance plan so that government as a whole can track uh, whether we are uh, you know, addressing issues of uh, gender equity uh, within the basic education sector. Next one, uh, Lino. So Chair, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This really does provide you with, uh, with a sense of uh, the key areas that we have had to report on to the Department of, uh, of Monitoring and Evaluation. Uh, next one, uh, Divo. These are some of the uh, evaluation system, the five-year agenda, policy priorities. Next one. And it also identifies the responsible unit or, or branch within the department. And as DJ said, it is a cross-cutting issue that we're doing across uh, various branches uh, that we're coordinating the work of the department in this regard. Thanks very much. Uh, so the next one focuses specifically on the work that we're doing with the provinces in terms of addressing school-related gender-based violence. Uh, we work in 43 districts at the moment, and we monitor them quite closely, up to 10,926 schools across uh, those provinces that we've identified there. We've introduced a specific uh, indicator into the APP that we will track over the next year. Um, and again, it's about how we address these issues of school-related gender-based violence on an ongoing basis, but also to encourage provinces and districts uh, to make money available to do this work, uh, you know, within schools. Next one. Um, together with the with the Global Fund, uh, who, who's funding our Adolescent Girls and Young Women program, we run uh, a, a series of interventions uh, across 12 high HIV uh, uh, burden districts across the country. 
Uh, we focus specifically on the I'm power program, which means no means no, targeting girls that are victims of gender-based violence. Uh, we work with them to build confidence, uh, to teach them close target skills. So if they are attacked, you know, what do you do? And the last part is called full force drills, where girls are taught how to defend themselves physically uh, from abuse. We do referrals in partnership with the Department of Social Development. Uh, we have a specific program that, again, our Deputy Minister leads on, on anti-bullying uh, awareness. Um, we reach out to all our stakeholders on GBV, school governing bodies, parents, traditional leaders, practitioners and learners, and there's several manuals available that we use to host those particular dialogues. And then to increase knowledge uh, and education on trafficking uh, with harmful traditional practices, pornography, um, and so on. Uh, we have a specific uh, program that is Say It campaign. Uh, which is a, a, a program that has almost organically emerged from the Speak Out uh, manual that we've developed you know, a few years ago. Next one. So in terms of GEM BEM, uh, this is just to give you some uh, of the sense of what we've been doing during the COVID period. We know that uh, children have been more at risk during that period. Our Deputy Minister has led various consultations, uh, webinars uh, with young people across the country. Even if you can flip through, you know, most of the rest, um, um, this gives you some of the work that we've done, you know, over Youth Day uh, last year. These are our partners that we've worked with. Next one. Uh, we've also taken it out into the provinces. Uh, next one. Next one. And you can see some of the issues that we focused on racism, uh, bullying, uh, cyber bullying. And we've also had some of our uh, provinces participate. There you see the MEC of, of Limpopo. Um, and of course, as I've said already, our, our deputy minister is the lead on, on some of these. I think that was the deputy minister of, of police who's, who's since been moved. Next one. Next, uh, so this part, uh, Chairperson, I will flip through very briefly because I know that the CEO of SACE will cover this in detail. Um, but just to say that we have been very concerned over the last couple of years about uh, the extent of sexual violence uh, against learners in schools, particularly perpetrated by, by teachers, both male and female. Um, the power to discipline educators, of course, lies with the uh, provincial education departments and with SACE, and therefore we work very closely with SACE, uh, you know, in terms of how we deal with this, and uh, we work closely with the ELRC as well. Next one. Um, the legislative mandate I am going to leave for uh, the CEO of SACE to deal with. This gives you a sense of some of the cases that we've had. Uh, I think this is the 2019-2020 uh, cases. Um, I know that the CEO has got more updated uh, uh, data that, that she will share, but we've dealt with 275 cases that have been reported in that uh, period. Um, 166 of those have been finalized. You can see that 50 teachers have been dismissed. There's some of those cases after they were dealt with by the provincial education departments that have been referred to either the ELRC or to SACE. Next one. Um, so again, I'm gonna leave this for CEO because her, her data is a bit more updated than ours. Next one, I'll leave on. Next one. Um, so in terms of the challenges that, that we've encountered is the, the uniform implementation of frameworks on the disciplinary procedures, we still have uh, different ways in which uh, provinces are implementing this. You'll find that a teacher is guilty of sexual misconduct in one province, the, the teacher resigns, emerges in a different province. Um, employers are obliged in terms of the disciplinary coded procedures to give uh, full pay, which is you know, obviously a, a, a massive financial implication. And so there's urgency to try to finalize uh, disciplinary cases uh, quickly. Vetting of staff is still, you know, is still a challenge, and and again, it's something done by SACE, so the CEO might want to talk about that. Uh, PEDs not taking the time to properly vet educators is, a, you know, is another concern. 
Next one. And then some of the, the mitigate, mitigating measures that we've implemented, standard operating procedures for employers of, of educators. Uh, here again, we work very closely across government to ensure that, uh, you know, teachers don't, uh, you know, that they're not able to escape justice when they are guilty. Uh, a, a, a very important innovation uh, was the ELRC Collective Agreement 3 of two, 2018, which uh, aims to centralize uh, sexual misconduct cases uh, within the ELRC and to deal with it very quickly. And then, of course, we've we've got a protocol for reporting and management of sexual abuse, which provide guidance specifically to districts, as well as to schools on what to do when cases are reported to them. Um, the the block on Purcell is quite an important one, so that if a teacher is found guilty and is dismissed, that that teacher then is blocked on Purcell so that they can't re-emerge, and of course that they struck off the roll by say so that they can't skip from the public. Uh, to the independent school sector. Next one. Um, in terms of teacher support, uh, capacitation and empowerment initiatives, there's various initiatives. And uh, again, Chairperson, I know that uh, the uh, CESA's uh, presentation picks up uh, a lot of what is in here, so I'm, I'm not going to speak to this. Next one. Um, Again, this is some of the uh, ongoing support that we are providing to schools. The, the last section, Chair, and I am moving towards uh, uh, concluding is, of course, in addition to dealing with the sector as a whole, we're also trying to deal with issues of transformation and gender equality within the DBE itself. Um, to do that, the, uh, the DG has appointed uh, a focal point person for us within the department. Next one. And that focal point uh, person has uh, the following responsibilities, is to look specifically at issues of employer health and wellness, uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, sexual harassment workshops organized, counseling sessions are provided, but ultimately to track uh, gender equity across appointments uh, within the department. Next one. Uh, these are some of the policies that we that we used to do that, uh, you know, through our, our recruitment policy to target specifically that 50%. We're not we're not there yet, and it's a, a major focus uh, for the department going forward. Uh, next one. Uh, these are some of the uh, programs that we use in bursary programs to ensure that uh, you know that some of our female officials are able to access further further education and training. Uh, internship and learnership programs to attract, uh, you know, young people into into the department to provide a conducive environment uh, through an employer health and wellness program, and we also provide mentoring and coaching uh, to support newly appointed, uh, you know, women that come into the uh, senior management service. Next one. Um, th these are some of the, the programs that the focal point person has run, uh, Thursdays in Black, to draw attention to gender-based violence uh, that affects specifically, uh, you know, women within the DBE. Uh, we provide HIV counseling and testing, several dialogues, and last year we also, uh, led by the Director General, uh, we had a men's forum uh, and dialogue within the department. Next one. Uh, next one, um, I'll leave on. So, Chairperson, that then concludes a rather lengthy uh, presentation. Um, I am going to hand over to the CEO of SAISTEN. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, DDG, and good morning to the Deputy Minister, our Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the Honorable members in the portfolio committee, our DG and the colleagues in the Department of Basic Education. As the DDG has already indicated, while the gender-based violence uh, is broad, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on sexual gender-based violence and the sexual bullying that is going around within the teaching profession. And, and in doing that, 
I want to also start with indicating that our vision 2025 as council is to inspire a credible teaching profession. Given what is going on in the profession in terms of denting the image, the status and the prestige of the profession, we felt we need to put all our hands on deck and make sure that we bring the credibility and integrity of the teaching profession back. And therefore, in doing that, our professional and ethical standards become very important in terms of making sure that we have an ethical teaching profession. Now, moving to the next slide in terms of the, legis the legislative and, and policy environment, obviously, our constitution of the country guides us. We've got the SAIS Act that gives the council all the powers and, and duties and responsibilities to make sure that uh, we have an ethical teaching profession that is beyond reproach. But also we have the, the SAIS Code of Professional Ethics that is speaking to the ethics of the profession themselves. Uh, this is the, the policy that we are using to say, if educators violate the children, if educators violate the parents or violate each other, this is the tool that we are using to make sure that we, we, we address those issues. The DDG has spoken about the relationship between says ELRC and, and and, and themselves in terms of dealing with sexual abuse and, and sexual broader sexual mis misconduct cases. And therefore the ELRC collective agreement number three of 2018 becomes important with regard to that, including the protocols that from the DBE that he has already spoken to. We cannot be in a position to implement a credible teaching profession and deal with the ethical standards accordingly if we are not taking into account the Children's Act and also which, which is protecting uh, the, the children's rights and, and making sure that we put the interest of the children at heart and first before we can even deal with other issues. And, and also one of the gap that we need to close as the sector is the extent at which we, are, we, we, we should be taking our sexual ethical misconduct uh, 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 verdict or, or those educators that have been struck off the role or being dismissed as a result of sexual misconduct cases to the South African police services so that they can be in a position to go through the, the criminal processes and end up in the National Register of Sexual Offenses. As, as part of our vetting process, as the, the DDG has already indicated, obviously one of the things that we do is to vet our educators against the database of, 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 the, of, of criminal records from the SAPS. But we are now working very closely with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development in terms of vetting against the National Register of Sexual Offenses. However, you are not finding too many in fact, not even say too many. We are, we, are, we are not even finding educators in that register, largely because of the extent at which we are not reporting these cases to SAPS for them to be processed and, and so that those educators can be convert, convicted to be in the National Register of Sexual Offense, Offenses. And, and obviously, we, we take you from other national uh, policies, including the National Strategic Plan on Gender, Based violence. Having talked about our code of professional ethics, uh, we are looking for the purpose of this, this topic and presentation at the relationship between educators and learners, but also the relationship between educators and colleagues. Because issues of sexual abuse in the schools, issues of broader sexual misconduct are happening between the teachers and, and, and learners in the majority but you also have incidences of educators and colleagues. Even more interesting, recently you're having issues between educators and parents, and we're still trying to collect data uh, from our files with regard to those uh, parents that are being abused by educators sexually, which is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that we are, we are trying to research and understand the circumstances around that. 
And then moving to the next slides, you would see that our code of professional ethics uh, speaks to educator and learner relationship as I've already indicated. And in itself, it's promoting gender equality. It's also looking at the rights and protecting the rights of children in terms of them not being violated from a sexual perspective and, and also making sure that educators do not use their position of power and authority to be dealing with sexual uh, misconduct cases within, within the schools. The next slide also speaks to, to the same uh, issues around uh, uh, educators respecting the dignity uh, and beliefs of the children and also making sure that we strengthen the country's constitution in terms of the rights of children and, and individuals that are enshrined within the constitution, including the values within the constitution that the DDG has, has already spoken to. The next slide also speaks to the relationship between educators, an educator and fellow colleagues within the schools because uh, you can't have a, a, a very good working environment if you have educators that are harassing themselves. We had a case of one of a, a, a principal and, 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 and the deputy that were harassing each other. Even more, there's a case in case of, of a principal that was sleeping with the deputy principal's children. And those are the kind of things that are making the schooling environment to be toxic and not to be not not to be conducive in terms of teaching and learning. Hence, uh, it's important for us as we continue to also look at the colleagues amongst themselves. Again, if you check the next slides, you will realize that uh, sexual misconduct cases continue to be part of the top three cases that we have within council. Obviously the first one we know is the, uh, the, the administering of corporal punishment, which has been outlawed. However, uh, consistently you have sexual misconduct cases be, uh, being the second in, in, in position. And therefore what we did was to try and unpack the sexual misconduct uh, cases that we received and classified them, classified them into six different areas, as you can see in the slide in terms of harassment, abuse, rape, assault, the improper relationship and, 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 and the sexual relationship. Uh, the next slide is just explaining them in brief, which I'm not going to, to go into. But if you check the next one, we have done the analysis only of the reported sexual misconduct cases. You may still have a lot of those cases that are happening within the provincial education departments, within the community societies that have not necessarily been reported to CC. So this is this is more on what has been reported so that you can see over the five years what have been the trends in terms of uh, what's happening in terms of violation of our children sexually, but also violation of colleagues, colleagues amongst themselves visually. Next slide, we are, we are unpacking the six areas that I've identified in terms of the sexual misconduct cases. But in doing that, we are presenting the reported teacher uh, sexual misdemeanors by type and also according to different provinces over the five years that I've already spoken to. Uh, you, you would see the numbers in terms of the provinces, and I always say when I report, I present these numbers that it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got too many uh, sexual misconduct, for example, in KZN, which are 100, 103 as compared to, uh, for example, uh, uh, Limpopo, which is 66. It, it, it really reflects on the extent to which these cases are being reported. Um, and I will continue to say Western Cape, KwaZulu Natal, and Gauteng continue to be the three provinces that are reporting religiously in terms of uh, the cases that they deal with and also complying with section 26 of the SACE Act. And hence you see uh, the numbers uh, of those provinces being in, 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 in high numbers as compared to, to other provinces. In the next slide, Chair, 
we we looked at the extent of the sexual misconduct cases during the period of COVID-19. Remember, we experienced as a country the pandemic from the end of towards the end of March. And therefore we said, let's look at what's happening from the 1st April 2020 until 31st July 2021, which is just you know, two weeks ago. And you can see that over that period, we had 167 uh, misconduct cases. Remember the SAIS code of professional ethics is, is applicable to the educators uh, 24 seven, 365 days, irrespective of whether you are in the school environment or not. So therefore, these activities years are happening in the schools, but also within communities, they are still being perpetuated by, by the educators. That is why even with lockdown, schools not, not taking place uh, because of the disruptions of pandemic, but you still have the numbers of ethical misconduct rising. We are also indicating, Chair, the the, the, the sources in terms of where these cases come from, you would see that uh, in the period that we are looking at, 1st April 2020 to 31st July 2021, you have provincial education departments being the highest. And uh, also we are beginning to see the issue of ethical misconduct in the, in the departments being centralized through the ELRC once the ELRC is done with the award, they send them to us as says for us to be able to strike the person of the role. Because if you don't do that, you remain with a dismissal from the employer. However, the person is still having the license to practice in terms of SAIS certificate. Hence, it's necessary for all the provincial education departments, including ELRC, and employers in independent schooling sector to finish says with the outcome of their cases in terms of those who have been dismissed so that we can continue in terms of striking them off from the role. We are, we are also presenting the six areas that are identified chair so that you can see where, where the prevalence is. For example, you'll see the sexual harassment of learners, uh, which is high, but also you, you have sexual assault of learners, which is second. And you will see that you continue to have rape uh, of learners, uh, whether it, it's the, the, the minors, which is statutory rape, or also those that are above 18 is still happening. But also, Chair, we are, also, if you check the last one, uh, which is number, which has got three, we, we are trying to curb the issue of authorities within schools, the school leaders, school managers, who are protecting their schools, who are protecting other teachers and covering up in terms of the, these cases. And therefore, one of the resolutions that have been taken by council is that we need to charge the, the educator, the principals and deputy principals or fellow educators that are hiding all these things and protecting and covering up because they are as guilty as the person who, who, who has raped Elena or who has abused Elena. So for so far in the period that we are reporting or from, from April 2022, July uh, 2021, we've got three that we dealt with. Again, uh, in, in the presentation of the DG, DDG, I'm happy that he, he spoke about the, the pro, program and uh, uh, an awareness that they are raising with regard to the boys and protecting them. Because as much as sexual abuse is happening largely with uh, uh, our male educators violating the female learners, you have the, the reverse happening uh, and it's picking up uh, if you check the, 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 the cases from the other previous financial years, every year we find a certain number of educators that are violating the, 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 the male, uh, the boys in schools, especially in high schools in terms of 
sexual harassment cases. I mean, you had a very big case in Western Cape of, of a similar nature. Uh, if you remember the Bishop uh, Boys College where the educator resigned, irrespective of you, an educator resign, we still follow the case because at the end of the day, you continue to have the SAIS license to practice. And therefore, the reason why we continue and pursue you, even if you resign, is because of we need to make sure that we strike you off the roll and take the license to practice back. Uh, the next slide gives you an indication that uh, during the 2020-21 financial year, which is currently being audited, which we'll be presenting to, to, to the Portfolio Committee on the 8th of October, you continue to have sexual misconduct cases being second. Uh, you can see we've got 81, uh, which is number two in terms of that, that particular area which means the scourge, the pandemic that we are talking about is still out there. And, 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 I, and as, as I always say, there's something different that we need to be doing over and above the interventions that we are already having, because clearly there's something that, that we, we should be pointing at in terms of people just not uh, listening or people just not uh, 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 responding to not abusing the children. Uh, the total sexual misconduct cases by province, we then said, let's look at this quarter, the first quarter for the new financial year, which is April, 1st April to 30th June, 2021. Already you can see that in quarter one only, we've got 64 cases and you can see uh, the provinces for now, I'm not sure what is it that was happening in Free State, but clearly I'm, I'm personally going through the files just to understand why the trends are still continuing, the manner in which they are continuing. Because if you've got 64 in quarter one, you can project to have double the number uh, or even three times the number by the time you, you, you come to the end of the financial year. We're also interested in the age cohort of the educators that are, that are uh, uh, practicing or violating the children in terms of the age. And, and 10 years ago, when we looked at the, the analysis, it was more your 45 to 54 year olds the, uh, and, and even above, then we said, let's continue. If you check the next slide, we're doing the, the, the trends analysis for, for, for the new, for the next 10 years, which is from 2009 onwards, so that we can begin to understand the, the picture even better as we move. And this will assist us in terms of making sure that our interventions are targeted at the right people and deal with the issue of GH accordingly. And, and in doing that, our assumption and hypothesis is that given the fact that currently you have the younger teaching profession or younger newly qualified educators entering the teaching profession, you are likely to have ethical misconduct cases even more in terms of the, the, the the ages, which are not much different between your high school learners and also the, the newly qualified educators. But also even more interestingly, in, the, in our analysis of, of qualitative research, we're looking at the profile of a typical sexual abuser in a school and, and also their demographics, because one of the reasons why schools are hiding them is because we're beginning to see the trend of certain subjects and the trend of certain people that are working in, 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 in spaces like your labs, your, your, your offices and whatever. And therefore, if we understand the profile of a typical sexual abuser, it will even assist us more to say as the sector, what kind of an intervention strategy are we, are we coming up with? So the trends also, if, if you go to the next slide, as, as you did, 
we we are i've already spoken about the the trend in terms of your female educators but also the the trend in single sex schools in terms of sodomizing it's even more in the boys uh, schools uh, 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 more. The, the, the even more painful trend is also on the children that cannot do anything for themselves. The, the blind, the, the deaf, the physically challenged, who are, who are being raped in numbers by educators. Uh, and I was even saying we've got a case right now as I'm speaking of one of the biggest uh, special school in Sloshangube. Uh, which which is continuing over and over and over again to to deal with this with these issues and and you remember about five four to five years ago, one of the deputy ministers also who was a learner at the same school raised a concern of her being raped in the same school by teachers. So so we need to have together with Houghton Department of Education a targeted. A way of dealing with issues in in particularly in that particular special school. Chair, some of the observations observations that we are we are bringing to the portfolio committee, uh, I think from the DDG's presentation, we've already touched on them in terms of the the, the power relations. I've spoken about the space in schools the authority, there's a trend of sex for Max, especially in high school when you deal with grade uh, eight to 11. Most of the things that we are seeing is, is teachers trying to make sure that they get favor from these learners. And one of the things that they use is to make sure that they promote them to the next grade uh, without necessarily uh, making it through the grade badge because you had a sexual relationship with a teacher therefore it becomes logical. Parents are selling the, the souls of their children. This is something that is of greater concern to us. And hence, one of the things that we are doing is to go to, we've got a program that was going to the churches because that's where you find many community members to try and speak to the parents because they are the ones who are making it impossible for us to deal with cases uh, accordingly. So some of the interventions, uh, Chairperson, if, if we move to the next slide and the next one, uh, we've already spoken about the issue of harsh sanctions and the relationship between DBE or non-provincial education departments and says in terms of making sure that those that are dismissed are forwarded to says for struck off and vice versa. When says struck off, it, uh, the case must go to the provincial education department or any other employer for because then that educator is deemed to have resigned in terms of the Employment of Educators Act. But also the issue of reporting to other government departments and institutions is very important uh, to make sure that we, we really make sure that those educators are not are declared not to be suitable to work with children anywhere in the country. And the issue that I raised in terms of reporting to SAPS, but also we reporting to Home Affairs so that immigration can begin to also deal with some of these issues, the Commission of Gender Equality and, and, and Human Rights Commission. Uh, we, we believe in evidence-based planning, evidence-based decision-making, and also a responsive kind of intervention that is based on research. And therefore, one of the things that we do continuously is trend analysis from a quantitative perspective uh, in terms of understanding the, the, the trends and prevalences in certain schools, in certain circuits areas. If you continue to have sexual misconduct cases like the school that I'm talking about in, in social movie, year in and year out, already we've got three teachers that we strike off. And then you continue to have the, clearly there's something that needs to be done differently from that particular school. And because of this trends analysis and whatever, we are able to pick up those issues and repetitive cases happening in particular districts, in schools, in circuits, et cetera. And, and from a qualitative perspective, we're looking at uh, factors that an environment that enhance sexual misdemeanors in schools. We've got the report already. 
but also I've talked, spoken about understanding the profile of or and demographics of a typical uh, 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 abuser. Education, information, and advocacy. I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on this one. The DDG has already indicated a whole lot of interventions from the department side. And in, in strengthening the work that DBE and all provinces are doing, one of the things uh, was to make sure that we develop a student teacher code of professional ethics, but also have a, a broader program that orientates student teachers on issues of ethical misconduct, but also on values of the teaching profession. And that program is going very well. You've got a different uh, cohort of student teachers, which is far, far, far different from your current uh, educators. And therefore, we need to make sure that we deal with them while they're still in, in school, in, in higher education institutions so that we can do that. So also the issues of webinars that we run on a daily basis, weekly, uh, between three and five, so that we can make sure that we we, we deal with our educators. Uh, let me not emphasize again on the values. Uh, our, the DDG has already spoken about it, and we we emphasizing the value-based teaching profession so that uh, that can be sort of a moral campus that, that when teachers are to make ethical judgment, ethical evaluation of a situation that they are in, the values can be in a position to guide them. And lastly, chairperson, we, we have the teachers' rights, responsibilities, and safety program that resulted in teacher safety and security handbook. While it focuses to a certain extent on physical security and a whole lot of other issues, but there are issues around various types of violence. Gender-based violence is one of them. Violence uh, against the LGBTQI community within our schools and, and violence against our educators are some of the things that uh, we, are, we are working on with regard to that. And therefore, we've continued to work with uh, BVOB uh, in terms of having an online program that we are agreeing that we, at some stage we'll put it on the DBE's learner uh, management platform so that educators can be in a position to access it. And we are also working on a whole lot of other support material and videos to, to deal with that. Yeah. So that's 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 all for us from SAIS Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I thought the the DG is still around to just give a concluding remarks, but uh, this is the presentation to members. So we'll await comments, additions, and whatever from members. Thank you, Chair. I am around DM, but uh, I think everything has been covered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tichi. Thank you, Tichi. Thank you, Tichi. Over to you, Chair. All right, DM. Thank you very much, Devonga. Um, and thank you to the to the presenters as well. Honorable members, those the presentation from both DBE and SAIS uh, on issues of gender-based violence and uh, their interventions. I see the hand of Van der Waals. Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning, colleagues in the department and the portfolio committee. Chair, I, um, I was going to refer to some of the sl uh, slides by SACE, uh, for example, 6 and 7, um, 12, 14, and so on. But um, SACE just raised a very important matter, and I was going to raise the question on um, after Dr. Whittle as well, is in June uh, this year, we had another case of a pupil, 11-year-old, uh, um, a raped um, in KZN and the um, teacher who was the least of that uh, allegedly did the deed 
uh, appeared in the magistrate's court, Modabdeni uh, court. And then we had this incident of the great one pupil now in Shoshangovi. And I'm, I just want one, I want clarity on, is this the third incident or were there three before this specific incident? And uh, the DG will recall that I have been very, very involved in the Setotolwani School of the Blind and Deaf earlier in uh, earlier years in Polakwani. And it was mentioned again that our deaf, uh, well, our blind learners specifically are, are really having a tough time. What I want to know is it is great to have who knows it. And I absolutely agree that uh, principals who don't report, there must be some some punishment there. It cannot go unreported. Um, it's, it reminds me of SAPS in this uh, country who doesn't report these things against women. We have to know, um, how are we fixing it? I mean, remember Michael McPoppy who fell in a pit toilet? We fought that tooth and nail to say that a great one pupil cannot go to a faraway toilet on his or her own. It is unsafe, especially where the toilets are bad, but also because like this six-year-old grade one pupil now in Shushanguvi, who went to a toilet and got allegedly raped by a general worker on the school grounds. Could have been a teacher like in other cases. What are we actually doing? How? Earth. And I really get so angry if teachers can't send a, another learner or themselves with a small children in our foundation stage to a toilet accompanied by somebody. Really, I, I just can't comprehend this. How on earth do you send a grade one ch child to a faraway toilet on, on her or his own? Can we just have clarity on the number of incidents at the school in Shoshangubi and what are we doing physically every day to make sure our small children and our girl children specific don't go to toilets alone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Honorable uh, Tembekwayo, Dr. Tembekwayo. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I just, I've got only one question to uh, the presenters. Um, because the whole information as it is presented today is centered around educators. But there is a recent case of uh, that happened in Kensan <clears throat> Primary School in Sochanguve at Block H, where a four-year-old was raped by a gardener. And then the problem in this scenario is that there, there are four gardeners in that school and uh, they all wear the same uniform, uniform. The day when that happened, they were all having masks. So it becomes very difficult for that four-year-old to can identify the person who, who, who raped her because they all look uh, the same. And as I'm speaking, the case is on, but no, none of them, none of the four uh, gardeners is arrested at this present moment. My question is because uh, these gardeners or cleaners and so on are all service providers in the schools, how can they be accommodated in the uh, project? Because the scenario is now taking place in a different uh, mode altogether. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nodada. Honorable Nodada. Okay. Honorable uh, Masabela. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Are you still there? Am, am I audible? Yes. 
Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, I've got only three questions to say. Chair, the first question, Chair, how many teachers have been struck of the role in the past two years? What are the processes of investigations when teachers are found to have contravened the teacher's professional code of conduct? This is in regard to sexual offenses where the teachers are reported to have conducted sexual relationships with learners. Then again, Chair, why is it that after so many years and a clear and urgent need that says still do not have offices in every province? This is despite the fact that the Department of Basic Education has offices in every province. Why has says failed to follow the department's footprint and be everywhere? Lastly, a uh, chair, what communication campaigns has says put in place to promote your services as an organization? We don't get to hear much of you unless an incident has occurred and you are forced to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Masawela. No data. Thank you so much, Chair. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Chair, I don't know to go, uh, because my network is not so great. It is. It is not great. Am I audible, Chair? Yeah, but you keep on breaking. Yeah, my network is bad, Chair. Uh, I'm in the rural areas, yeah. Can't you write? Uh, okay, let me just try, Chair. If you can't, if it's still bad, just let me know. I'll just uh, maybe forward the questions to Lorel and Jawson. Awesome. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, just to say, I just wanted to check. Uh, those teachers that have been reported to say it's for sexual misconduct or abuse. How many of them are still employed and working at school at the moment? Secondly, how many of them have been criminally charged? Would those that are criminally charged or all of them that are offenders or alleged offenders, were the background checks you know, with criminal with the with criminal records and the sexual offenders list done. And what is the challenge of vetting um, teachers, as you have indicated? Now, between those reported and those teachers that have been dismissed as a result of these reports, what is the dismissal rate from says? Then lastly, to say, it's over and above mandatory reporting of incidences, what other measures or programs or plans have been put in place to prevent sexual assaults from happening again in schools? If you can just guide me on those questions. To DBE, I just wanted to check, how is you know, the department measuring the success of the girls' boys' education movement? Um, if you can just uh, uh, give an indication to that. And on slide 17, there's a mention of violence pre prevention forum. Can you maybe give an elaboration on this? What role does it play in preventing gender-based violence? What success have come out of this forum, if any? Um, and you know, to, just to check its effectiveness. Second, lastly, with regards to slide 30, um, it's unclear how the department monitors the success of these, uh, you know, gender-based violence programs. Um, you know, can you elaborate on this? You know, how do you measure the success or how do you monitor these particular programs to see the impact um, on the ground? 
And then lastly, there are a few programs that focus on, on teachers uh, or teaching girls how to get out of violent or high-risk situations. You know, does the department intend to create, you know, programs that focus on training boys in violent prevention, for example? Uh, and this, this last question is one that's very close to me. Uh, you know, as a person that actually has a foundation that develops the boy child, if you can maybe, uh, you know, give a, a, an answer to those. Thank you so much, Chair. Honorable at once. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I lost network for a while. Uh, no, man, thank you very much. Let me also uh, greet uh, uh, all uh, that has uh, that is in the meeting, <clears throat> and appreciate uh, you know the reports and and presentations that we, we received. Uh, during Women's Month, Month, and I think uh, they are relevant for us, you know, to get an opportunity to discuss, um, you know, the gender-based issues. As uh, we know, it was pronounced by the president. It's one of the pandemic that we have in our country, and uh, as the portfolio committee, we received that this information on how, at the level of uh, education sector, is being dealt with. Uh, let me also appreciate uh, uh, some of the uh, the progress that we see. It, uh, it has happened in the 2020, 2021 uh, financial year, as reported uh, by SAIS, um, more especially um, the breakthrough of now charging those uh, principals and officials at the level of the school that are not, not coming forth with the, with the information. I think we are actually seeing some progress and hope that uh, as time goes by, it will go up until to the community level or at the household level that they'll be able to, uh, <clears throat> you know, find a, a time or, or a place where they can report all this, uh, the cases even when they happen at home, because some of the, the cases that uh, are not reported of uh, sexual, you know, harassment and sexual misconduct, uh, both to learners and educators uh, start, you know, even in, at the community level. Some of them are even abused at home, you know. We know all the challenges that are in our societies, some, the, you know, the areas where there's a level of you know uh, abuse of alcohol that would maybe lead to to such uh, cases happening or drugs uh, at some point so it's some of the information that i think for me is a highlight that at least we see now they're going down to that level of making sure that they get you know sufficient and in, enough information to to deal with uh, with perpetrators uh, chair but i'd want to check with uh, the CEO uh, of says um, when they compare or make comparison with uh, the previous years, are they, you know, um, progressing, you know, enoughly so, or are they declining? Uh, 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 those cases that are, are reported, is there any improvement on on the on the side of 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 reporting? or because of the measures now that, that, that uh, they are putting in place, including also the, the education sector. I just wanted to check if there's uh, any improvement on that because um, we, we might sit here and think that uh, we are progressing, but when it comes to the truth and realities that many cases that are happening, uh, uh, it seems that uh, we're not uh, winning the battle. Um, I heard members spoke about uh, a lot about the case of uh, a seven year old. And I think it's a thorny issue in our country that uh, a, a child at that, you know, very young age, you know, will be abused like that at school where they're supposed to be safe. And 
up until today, there's no no one is arrested, and uh, you you ask yourself whether um, is this matter has been taken seriously or not. Uh, how could it, it go up up until to more than two weeks? No one is being arrested. Uh, maybe if um, we can get also a feedback on that one, what is uh, really a challenge for this uh, case not to be, you know, to, 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 be, to be progressing. It's not only that case, there are many of them and we see on, on, on the presentation by says that there are many cases that uh, are happening, but at least these ones are reported and we see the progress uh, so far. Uh, but this recent one, there's nothing that uh, we can say there is a progress on that one. Um, my other question maybe will be on, you know, uh, the involvement of the of the community or parents, you know, and more especially in in campaigns or your, or your awareness campaigns. Uh, how how are they, you know, relating to to such? Uh, campaigns or projects that are, are in place uh, in making sure that you as the department you are dealing away with the uh, you know the gender-based violence that is happening in schools because uh, it starts it's within, 11 hours that's within uh, our communities uh, i would just want to check how what is the you know the the participation of of uh, uh, our our communities or even parents, even at the level of the SGB. Uh, that will be my questions. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Suela. <coughs> uh, greetings to the Chair and thank you for the opportunity. Greetings to colleagues and uh, departmental officials as well. Chairperson, let me also welcome the presentations that we, we received. I have one or two questions though. With reference to the case, to the rape case that happened recently, where a young child was a victim, it is indeed so sad, Chair, to hear that school employees who are supposedly uh should ensure that schools are safe havens for children and all other employees are they themselves perpetrators Jefferson, what i would like to know about this incident it's whether it is not dbe policy that to have small children escorted by at least an adult when they visit the toilet. Now, if this is the case, would the school involved be held accountable for what happened? Or it is just a case, it happened, and so what? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh... Um, to all honorable members for their um, participation and inputs. Um, from mine, there are just few issues as well that I would want um, to raise, uh, particularly in the department. But I must say both, pre both presentations were very informative and I think uh, really they are, they are good presentations, um, uh, both of them. I was seated here um, and I was asking myself, Uri, you remember 2019, we had a very um, hot presentation that was presented by you. And I think it was led by Dr. Whittle as well um, of the CSC, the, the sex education. I remember we even had a debate in the house about it. Um, you would remember where Honorable Sugars was very, very um, 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 uh, emotional about it. Um, can you just be briefed? How far is it? Is it? Uh, uh, how far is it? You remember there, there was issue with parents um, that were were raising serious concerns about sex educations. Uh, 
that must happen in, in our schools. And then the second issue that I want to I want to raise, there is a slide where DBE is saying they are offering um, sexual and reproductive health services in secondary learners. Can you be specific on the nature of um, on the nature of services that you are offering to to the secondary learners? Because just like yourselves, um, health sector is also very broad. Um, so can you can you just be specific uh, in, in telling us um, uh, those those services? And then there's another slide as well where you you are citing that um, um, there there are there are there are lessons plans which are piloted by the USA USAID um, in in ten districts or or rather in seven uh, provinces. Which districts are, are those um, that 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 that, that are, are piloted? And then. There is a slide, I think it's like 30, um, where, the, where you are saying that the, the, the department, um, the department's APP for 2020-2021 had no um, indicator on gender-based violence. Now, if all of us we agree in this meet, in this um, meeting that actually it is a second pandemic, why would you not have it in your APP? Why would not why would it not reflect as um as an indicator in your APP? How 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 serious then is the department taking the issue of gender based violence? Um, if it can't even re reflect on your on your on your performance plan. And then the other issue, there is also a slide which uh, speaks on the referral um, of uh, DSD um, to Tuzela care, care centers, where you are, you are saying that uh, there, are, there are social workers that you are allocating to, to schools. Um, how many schools uh, are those, uh, or which provinces rather? Because I'm just trying to think in, Many schools that we attended uh, during our oversights, actually in all the schools that we went to, there were schools where you would see there was a need actually of a social worker and there is no social worker. And where we had raised such questions, we were responded that uh, there is a, um, an intergovernmental relation, which of course we expect it would be there with the Department of Social Development. But there are no social workers that are um, deployed in schools as and when they are needed, they are able um, um, uh, to respond to the issues that are there at that particular moment. And um, the issue of cases that you have, that you are saying that have been reported, where in case that ends 73%, Gauteng 68%, and Western Cape 61%. What interventions then have you or you are doing? to reduce the, the number of, of, of percentage. And then the, 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 the last question, which I think as well, it would be both to the department and says, is the, it's a presentation by, by the way, by, by DPE, where you speak of, um, of prevention of, of re-employed and former, and former educators um, who were charged for, for, for misconduct. Um, my interest in particular in this case is um, if they are charged with, with, with misconduct and you make sure that you prevent uh, that they must be re-employed, do you make means that uh, these educators uh, must appear on your database as being charged for misconduct and particularly if it's a misconduct of rape? And if that is the case, what is the reaction of the teacher unions um, with regards to that? Um, yeah, I think from my side, um, those will be the the issues that I would have that I that I would have wanted to raise. Like I've said, I think the, the both presentations have been very very good presentations, well crafted um, from both uh, institutions. 
And I would then hand over to you, DM, um, to lead the responses. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, we appreciate and welcome all the questions by members and uh, to me, they are very relevant. But I want to say on the questions, Chair, when we need specific numbers, we may not be in a position to provide those numbers now, like the, okay, trends we may, and uh, the rate, the rate, that question which will need the rate, what is the rate of, that one will, um, will bring the answer if members become specific and ask us that as a written response, because we'll have to visit the figures and calculate the rate and come up with specifics. Like questions to say in, in two years, what are, how many teachers were struck off the role and all those. If the CEO will have such information, that will be a bonus, Chair, but uh, we always request members that let's not ask specific, special numbers, because we may try to come up with numbers that may not help. But let me take this opportunity and give to DG and the team to respond, then I'll come in the end. DG, over to you. If DG, because where he is, the network is not very good. Uh, thank DG. you, DM. Oh, thank thank you. you. I mean, Alwal North, I hope uh, this rural area is better than the one that uh, Honorable North that I seen. Uh, thank you, Chair and Honorable Members, for uh, very, very uh, uh, important questions that you have raised. We'll do our best to respond to them. Uh, this time around, I'm going to uh, request Dr. Whittle to help me quite a lot in dealing with uh, many of this. I won't do what I usually do to try and respond to all of them. Now, the issue of the, the, the learner in Harangua, uh, Honorable Dr. Tembekwa Ayo says, four, four year old. What I know from even the discussion that I've just had with the MEC and the HOD as the meeting was uh, going on, they are referring to a seven year old like uh, uh, Honorable Adun's uh, confirmed. So the four-year-old, if we could get more details around the four-year-old so that we, we find it could be a different matter. As somebody said, we could be dealing with different cases. But with respect to the seven-year-old, what has happened is that uh, four general assistants have been suspended, according to the MEC and the head of the department. And the MEC says to me, that's all that we can do as education. And we are putting pressure to the South African police services to, to do their identity parade as quickly as possible so that we get whoever is responsible because the, apparently the Elena insists that it is a general worker uh, that has uh, raped her. So that's what the MEC uh, has, has indicated to me a while ago, uh, that they, they are awaiting the police to do the identity parade as quickly as possible so that the perpetrators are indeed uh, taken to book. So with, with uh, the, the four-year-old, I'm, I'm requesting that uh, the, the Honorable Dr. Tembeku Ayo could give us more details we could be dealing with a matter uh, that is different from the seven-year-old. And at any rate, Chair, as you would know, the four-year-old in the main would be with social development and not with basic education. If they are with basic education, it would be an early learning center attached to a primary school. And there are very few of those. But if we could get more details, uh, it, it would help us a lot. Um, the well. The, the other questions, uh, um, oh, Honorable van der Waalt, uh, uh, what we, we have done in terms of dealing with these incidents 
and uh, bring some intervention measures. For grade R classrooms, we are now isolating grade R classrooms from the rest of the classrooms. And so that if a grade R learner goes to a restroom, uh, such a learner would be accompanied by a teacher. But, but for grade one, quite honestly, I don't think there is a policy that says every grade uh, one learner uh, must be accompanied by a teacher. We might have to go back to the drawing board and look at that. For grade R learners, uh, generally it's manageable. Uh, the, in, in the main, there wouldn't be many. And if you have an assistant, as the teacher would go and accompany those who go to the restroom, then the assistant would remain and even still supervise those that are in the classroom. That grade one, grade two, grade three learners are accompanied. To be quite honest, uh, it's, it's not part of our policy. But as you have indicated, given this incidence, uh, I will uh, discuss it with the uh, heads of education and look at whether there is an intervention of this nature that we can come up with. And whilst we say uh, this in the foundation phase, they must be accompanied, what happens to those who remain in the tax room? Because there's another liability there that we carry. So, so we'll definitely look at that. Uh, fortunately, we do have a special headcom meeting tomorrow. I might uh, 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 look at the agenda tomorrow, if not very soon, to discuss that matter as a matter that we might look at uh, as a policy review and table it at, at CEM. Uh, so what I can say from an infrastructure point of view, where I am, I'm monitoring infrastructure. Uh, toilets for grade R, you separate them with a fence, you build them close to uh, the classroom of grade R learners. That I can put my head on the block. But for the other grades, one, two, and three, uh, that, that does not obtain. And that's why I said it's a matter that we might have to look at. Um, well, Honorable Noda, the, um, well, we measure the impact of these programs uh, in the main one. The level of reporting could also reflect uh, whether the interventions are working, awareness among learners, and so on. And the fact that the, the reporting has gone uh, high historically, it shows that uh, uh, this intervention, sexuality, awareness, and uh, uh, gender-based uh, violence that learners must report them, it shows that uh, the interventions are working. But also we measure them through uh, the level of occurrence. Because if the, the, the general population in our schooling system is aware and they are combative towards this, the level of occurrence will also go down. Those are some of the indicators that uh, we're looking at. But there are also uh, means through which, I mean, the international tests are also testing on these things in terms of the level of awareness and, and so on. And we pick up uh, whether the, the interventions that we have uh, do make any difference. Um, and then, okay, DBE's role in preventing gender-based violence and what success, I've spoken to that. The presentation, it's all about the role of DBE, the impact I've indicated. Dr. Whittle will speak to even uh, the details of the evaluation uh, in, that, in that regard. And Honorable Adunes, thank you for the appreciation and uh, thank you also to all honorable members for appreciating the effort uh, that we have made. And thank you also, Honorable Adunes, for making us aware that it's a broader societal problem. It begins in respective households. It goes to communities and schools as a microcosm of civil society. They do reflect on the prevalence of this. Um, I've, I've indicated about the issue of, uh, you know, the perpetrators um, uh, at provincial level, they're expected to carry out disciplinary action. 
And over and above that, then SAIS will also carry out its own process in terms of the, the ethics of the profession. Involvement of parents, we do address the uh, uh, National Consultative Forum, Association of School Governing Bodies, you have them there. The professional bodies in education, you have them for uh, public ordinary schools and for public schools for learners with special education needs. They are also part of this forum. We meet with them quite regularly. And Honorable Siwela, um, well, I've addressed the issue of the policy for accompanying learners. Um, and then, Honorable Chair, thank you also for appreciating the presentations. Um, the issue of sexuality education, Dr. Whittle will speak to that, how far we have gone. And, and I must say, the, the, the differences on these matters, especially the issue of uh, sexuality education, it, it's a matter of belief. It, it's a matter of uh, what belief uh, do you subscribe to and what do you believe should be taught to children and what should not be taught to children, which is a highly contested matter. Uh, personally, I have beliefs as well, uh, but but some people uh, ensure that uh, their beliefs uh, are also reflected in how we carry out matters of uh, of public education, which is sometimes difficult. And I'm sure Dr. Whittle will reflect more on that. And I know that Honor Honorable Suker holds very strong views around these matters based on her belief. Um, okay, the issue of district that provided with lesson plans, Dr. Whittle will also indicate uh, progress made in that regard. Chair, I must humbly request that it's not everything that we do that is reflected on the APP. You could imagine uh, if we were to put all the important things that we do into the APP, it could also be that we are in the process with the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation to look at how we craft the target on what needs to get into the APP. But I do believe that this one is important enough. We'll discuss with the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation to look at how we reflect on gender-based violence in our APP, given a number of areas that we are involved in. There's an area of responsibility at school level. There's an area of responsibility in our offices. There's also an area of offices of responsibility in terms of uh, the teachers that we employ. So we we'll look at how we, we find expression for that. Uh, in our uh, APP. Social workers, social workers are there as part of the multidisciplinary team at district and provincial level, but it's very few schools that would have this uh, psychosocial services expect, uh, mainly your uh, schools for learners with special education needs, but the majority of them are located at district level and provincial level, else multidisciplinary teams that go out to schools and to learners based on the identified uh, need. Um, oh, reaction of teacher unions. Fortunately, teacher unions, we are one on teachers who are involved in uh, matters of sexual abuse, uh, matters of gender-based violence. We are one. I, I haven't uh, picked up even one of the five teacher unions uh, uh, that seek to defend teachers in this regard, all that they would do really is to ensure that uh, procedures are followed. But I do know that they abhor sexual abuse, they abhor uh, gender-based violence, which involves educators and so on. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister and uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, I am going to humbly request that you allow me to bring in Dr. Whittle to address some of the areas that uh, I did not adequately address or address at all, uh, given the fact that uh, the bulk of this are in his line function. We'll see whether there's a need. I haven't identified that, whether there's anything that requires Mr. Kuno or anything that requires Mrs. Geya 
or requires the branch of teachers, Mr. Padayaki. I think Mr. Uh, Dr. Whittle is the one who would be relevant to come in handy now. If you allow that, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister and Honorable Chair. It's highly allowed. You take over until the CEO of says, then you bring back. Thank you, Tichi. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister. Dr. Whittle? Thank you very much, DG. Um, I'll, I'll just deal with the ones that you didn't address. I think you've covered uh, most of them adequately. I just wanted to say to Honorable Van der Waal, uh, that we do encourage as part of the National School Safety Framework that schools have a roster available uh, for playground duty uh, monitoring. Um, so that when children are on their break, uh, we, we encourage schools to do an analysis of where they have most of the incidents and that they then provide adult supervision to those particular sections of the playground. Um, I agree with DG that the one blind spot, I suppose, that we have is with regards to toilet facilities and, and one of it has to do with uh, physical infrastructure, which as DG has indicated, we, we are addressing already. And the other one is what happens when the child has to, has to leave class during class time. Um, what kind of measures do we put in place to, you know, to ensure that those children are supported? And that would also then respond to the question that Honorable Suella has raised. Um, in terms of Honorable Nordada, the, the, the issue of boys has been uh, an area that I think we have neglected, not just as DBE, but I think more broadly over the last 20 uh, odd years. There is very clear evidence now that boys are falling behind, uh, educationally speaking, that fewer of them are accessing higher education, um, that they are abused at more or less the same rate as girls at the moment, which is what uh, you know uh, CEO's presentation refers to as well. And so what we're doing over the, over the next little while is to coordinate a range of different role players within the sector. Uh, we, we are very clear at the moment about the evidence base for what programming works well for girls. Um, but we, we really are in the dark in terms of what works uh, for boys. And so the Violence Prevention Forum that we, we refer to is a forum that coordinates a range of organizations, uh, both civil society, uh, government, as well as uh, academic institutions. Um, they increasingly working with us to, to begin to provide an evidence base for what works for boys. And going forward, we obviously want to uh, begin to, to program more uh, sy systematically uh, you know, into the basic education sector in terms of what would work uh, for boys. We've worked with a range of uh, development partners over the last year to begin to acquire um, a resource base that we could use for that purpose. But we're also reorienting um, our uh, conditional grant for life skills so that in addition to dealing with issues that are affecting girls, we also now begin to, to address those issues that are causing boys to be lagging behind, dropping out at a higher rate um, than, than girls. In terms of the impact uh, assessment that Honorable Nodada was referring to, uh, we conduct on a, on a four yearly basis, uh, we conduct a survey into, into, into school safety. Uh, we pick up issues around um, uh, sexual abuse, uh, corporal punishment, uh, bullying, uh, and we track that uh, you know, over time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that over the last 10, 15 years, those rates have consistently come down, um, but they're not at the level that would be acceptable. Unfortunately, over the last uh, you know, couple of years, because of COVID, uh, we haven't uh, conducted uh, 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 you know, another survey, but we are in advanced discussion with, uh, discussions with one of our universities uh, to roll out a, 
another survey you know towards the end of this year and we would gladly bring that back to you you know once that is finalized in terms of gem bem there, there, there is uh, an evaluation that has been conducted but more around the functioning of the clubs and how we can go about strengthening that uh, we have spoken to to unicef you know who is the major a partner on the Jimbem clubs uh, about an impact assessment for uh, for next year, and if we secure the the appropriate resources, uh, that's then what we'll do. We we have introduced as part of the program uh, an an alumni uh, component, so so uh, learners that uh, you know finish high school go on to university. They then continue. To work with us and continue to work in schools to plow back as part of what they have benefited uh, uh, from this program. The, the issue of self-defense for, uh, you know, for boys, I think it's part of the programming that I've referred to and something that, of course, we will come back to. Chairperson, then, I mean, I think DJ's covered most of the other questions. I, I want to respond to some of the issues that you've raised. So the first one is about how far are we with comprehensive sexuality education? And just to indicate that we have been implementing comprehensive sexuality education uh, in the, as part of the South African curriculum over the last you know, 20 odd years. Uh, we continue to, to innovate around how we can improve um, the, the provision of life orientation and life skills in schools. And part of what I referred to earlier was, was part of that uh, uh, initiative to improve uh, the development of the, of the new life orientation state-owned textbooks that you know, will come into the system next year is, is one such initiative. Improve training on comprehensive sexuality education for, for teachers, both in-service teachers as well as uh, training teachers. Um, and so the, the, the program as part of comprehensive sexuality education has been around for a, for a long time. What has caused the, the controversy you know, at the time was the development of these lesson plans that we, that we piloted. As you know, some people objected to some of the images that got used in, the, uh, um, you know, in those lesson plans we've since uh, you know, after consultations with the Council of Education ministers, the Deputy Minister, the Minister and the DG, we've removed most of those uh, issues that have been, you know, offensive to people. Um, but the program is continuing, we're continuing to, uh, to implement that program. Um, the, the, the districts, unfortunately, Chairperson, I, I don't, you know, off the top of my, my head recall all of the districts, but it's certainly something that we can provide to you, uh, you know, after this meeting. Um, I think the DJ has covered the, the issue of social workers. Unfortunately, Chairperson, we simply don't have the requisite resources to provide social workers to every school. Um, but we are innovating around this. As DJ has indicated, uh, we have multi, uh, you know, functional teams that are operating at the, at the district level. We also provide about 4,000 learner support agents uh, to schools at the moment. We provide them to schools uh, in, in high risk uh, districts. Um, and we have recently uh, received some additional funding to increase the numbers from the US government. Uh, they've given us uh, funding to employ another 400 uh, young people. So that's an additional 400 schools uh, and their contracts are for three years. Uh, those young people have come into the system. They're busy, we're busy training them at the moment and they provide very basic uh, psychosocial support uh, to, to learners in schools. Um, the prevention of re-employment. So, uh, you know, Mr. Sally Faker may want to comment on this, but if you are found guilty in terms of the guidance that is provided to uh, provincial education departments of sexual miscon misconduct involving children, then you are banned from the profession for life. Um, so there's no way that if you are found guilty in terms of the guidance issued by uh, the Department of Public Services and Administration, that you can come back into the system and, and um, you know, like DJ said, we have had support from 
the organized teaching profession uh, profession as part of that. And then Chair, just the last one from my side is the your question about what constitutes sexual and reproductive health services that are offered to um, to children in high school. So we do a range of, of services. Most of these are done through mobile clinics that we provide to, uh, you know, to schools in grade uh, five and six at the moment, we provide the HPV, uh, which is a vaccination that prevents cervical cancer. Um, we then do a range of uh, health screening services. We screen for oral health, for vision, for hearing, for speech, for nutrition, for mental health, um, psychosocial support, for anemia. Um, we then provide basic uh, health education on how to prevent the spread of tuberculosis, for example, HIV, STIs, teen pregnancy. And then we provide uh, testing on site. So we test for, for HIV, we test for pregnancy, we test for HDR, for, for STIs, and we also provide uh, opportunities for children to report uh, to the nurse on site when the clinic does visit. Um, and then we have uh, absolute referrals. So these are referrals that for, for things that are requested by, by learners uh, that they are referred to the local clinic. Um, these are services that are not provided on site. Uh, so it's a, you know, ARTs, if a child is positive for HIV, we refer them uh, to get their medication. A TB management, a voluntary uh, male circumcision is done off-site. Uh, and any kind of contraception uh, other than condoms that, that uh, you know, children require, they would then be referred to uh, the local uh, health facility. Uh, thank you, Chair. That, I think, covers me. I'm not sure, Mr. Faker, if you want to comment on, on that one area before we hand over to the CEO of SAIS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Yes, um, <clears throat> we've actually been um, this goes hand in hand in terms of the collective agreement with the um, ELRC. And the reason why we actually brought in this particular amendment to the Employment of Educators Act is, um, is the fact actually that the, the, um, the misconduct um, the cases involving actually um, a learner is very sensitive actually and many of the um, I mean, the parents don't really want um, the children to go through actually a number of the processes in that regard. So firstly we came at in terms of the collective agreement number three of, um, of 2018 and that basically just allows actually a single process in terms of charging an educator with actually misconduct. In the past, of course, they had to be charged actually by the provincial education department. Then they had to be charged actually by um, see the matter goes to actually um, arbitration and then there's a consolation process and um, arbitration process. And then of course the matter goes to say so, so and that puts a lot of stress onto the learner and the parents and everybody that needs to testify in that regard. But however, we also actually um, we discovered actually with that actually that um, many of the teachers find find back to ways back actually into education, and because there was not a clause in terms of the employment of either of um, educators act that, that that actually prevents him from being reemployed in terms of actually going forward, that is why we came out in um, 2021 with um, the the reemployment with regard to educators and an in the indicator that has been found guilty with regard to sexual assault or a a sexual relationship with a learner at a particular school, or even actually um, assault in terms of previously actually a body um, um, a body harm, they basically barred um, for life in that regard. That also um, protects the, the, the department as well as the the government itself in, in terms of um, vicarious liability in terms of obviously going forward. In that regard, as always, as also regarded as being um, a, a preventive measure um, with regard to SAIS actually as well. And um, as Dr. Butler indicated, actually, we do have, we started regular meetings now actually with SAIS ourselves at the ELRC, whereby we um, discussing these matters on actually um, a quarterly basis in that regard. Um, that also, of course, um, complements actually the 
as a block on Persia, which you put um, a block on Persia actually as well. So if um, any educator wants to come actually back in service before they can before they can they can load anything actually onto personal with regard to the appointment of that particular educator. The personal system, of course, actually will um, check out the appointment of that particular actually educator in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Faika. CEO, I'm handing over to you. Okay, thank you very much, TDG. Uh, let me just start with the last question raised by the chairperson just to add to what my colleagues in the DBE indicated. Indeed, what, what we do with regard to those educators that have been uh, struck off from the role, we send them to the nine provincial education departments, including the DBE, just to make sure that they are blocked against PESAL, as uh, my colleague has, has just indicated. Also, that gives us an opportunity to see if they are still in the employ or not. Often, you would find one or two, but the majority would be, would be blocked. And in that case, it means we need to inform the departments and they, they indeed assist us in terms of making sure that those educators are blocked. From an independent schooling perspective, as well as those educators that are employed in terms of the SGBs, because you don't have a, a common uh, human resource kind of a system, we encourage them to check with us before they employ the educator. So that you don't have, so that we can be in a position to lose the, the 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 cracks that might be there in terms of them jumping off from from the public schooling system and moving into the independent schooling system. So those mechanisms are really working very well. You might have one or two cases that might fall into the cracks, but generally they are working uh, extremely well for us. Uh, I think the, the DG and DDG also uh, responded on the issue of the, the teacher unions. In fact, what we've observed, uh, Chairperson, all the teacher unions, five of them have got gender-based violence programs and we work collaboratively with them. But in addition to that, we've observed in our disciplinary hearing processes, they choose to represent an educator and not defend and which is something which is very good because they are sending a message out there to say as teacher unions they are denouncing sexual misconduct cases in schools and they have been upfront about it and and during this uh, women's month we've seen unions and i've seen for example uh, start to having a bigger men's forum conference to confront these issues and deal with them accordingly. And obviously other unions are having those programs as well. Uh, and also on our registration database, the registration database, we mark them. Uh, we, we don't delete them completely. We soft delete them in, in IT's language so that when uh, an investigation is being done against them in terms of employment, we can be in a position to pick that up. The, the issue raised by honorable adjuncts in terms of uh, whether if we're making comparison, whether is there any de declining or increase in terms of the cases. It's a very difficult one. You may say, uh, there's an increase, mainly because of awareness that is being raised across the entire sector. And as a result, communities, parents, and everybody else is beginning to be aware that there must be reporting that must be done. And therefore, if you check the trends from the, the presentation that we made, there's an increase. And the fact that sexual abuse, uh, sexual misconduct cases are not moving from second position throughout the five years, and this is the sixth year, it's telling us that uh, that the numbers are, are, are continuing to go up 
they are continuing to rise instead of, of, of going down. We are having programs, and, and I know there's a general question that has been raised about whether there's any campaign from this perspective and awareness from this perspective in terms of these issues. Again, the presentation that we made just now is indicating some of the programs, some of the projects that we are running uh, from, and, and we believe in running this across the teacher education and development continuum, meaning starting from faculties of education in terms of the student teachers, moving to our newly qualified educators up to the practicing educators. So the sessions that we do, the material that we have, the research that we have, is across the entire teacher education uh, continuum to make sure that you don't have a gap. We don't have a situation where you go, when they, they move from, from higher education institutions going into schooling, you're dealing with a deficit model of, of developing an educator. So in order to do away with the deficit model, you need to have a, a structured way of dealing with a, a, a education, information, awareness, advocacy, communication across the entire continuum. And that is why we're working very closely with our student teacher movements uh, and also together with our teacher unions and provincial education departments and, and our educators. Also in terms of the awareness, what we have instituted is to have every second day when, when during term, not when schools are closing or closed, we have literally every second uh, day in a week. You can see our stats in the quarter, we did 8,800. We're having specialized uh, sessions, webinars on sexual misconduct issues, on the code of professional ethics, on violence against uh, each other in terms of issues of sexual abuse, in terms of LGBTI issues and the broader teacher safety issues. And, and surprisingly for us, educators are coming on board voluntarily without even complaining about data and a whole lot of other issues. Where possible, we've been funding some of the educators to be able to join. However, when the lockdown levels go down, we also go into, into the field to make sure that we, we assist those educators that are in remote rural areas that cannot be in a position to have improved connectivity. So, so the awareness is there, hence I said, the research that we're now doing, it's looking at what is it over and above the issue of us advocating, uh, the issue of department running a whole lot of programs on these issues that we continue to have numbers uh, uh, going up. There must be something else that we're not looking at. And, and the research that we're conducting at the moment should be able to give us some idea because we're looking at the profile and also the, the demographics and also the nature of a typical uh, sexual offender in the schooling environment or in the, in the teaching profession. We do work collaboratively with the department of, um, I'm, I'm going to Honorable uh, Nodaga now, this question in terms of uh, how many educators are still employed. At the moment, like the DM has said, it's, it's, it's difficult to give you the exact numbers. But I can tell you, having worked with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Depart uh, uh, Development in the past two years, there's only one time that we found an educator in the National, National Sexual Offenders Register. And it goes back to the issue that I've raised to say, we can do all that we can in terms of forwarding the cases to the SAPS, how they are being dealt with on the other side in terms of this SAPS, taking them through to make sure that there's conviction. Remember the issue with your national register of sexual offenders is that if you are not convicted, you can't be in that register. And that is why you may have essays over 5,000 educators that are sexually abusing children. However, if they are not in that particular register because of lack of conviction, then 
you, you, you're still having that particular challenge. At least the Department of Social Development, uh, we are reporting very religiously in terms of those uh, educators to make sure that they are declared not fit to, to work with children. Plans to prevent sexual abuse or harassment or rape one of the things that we say to educators in all our sessions, in everything that we do with them, awareness and whatever, is that they need to choose to be ethical. You can do all that you, you, you can as DBE, as PED, as SAS, as teacher unions. However, it remains with me as Ella to choose to, 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 to be a value-based kind of a person, to have a moral campus to be able to use the values that I have to guide my ethical judgment, to guide my ethical evaluation, to say, this is a 15 year old. I can't be sleeping with my 15 year old. It's as good as sleeping with my daughter. Uh, there isn't much that we can do as an organization or even as department in terms of saying, uh, we can 100% we can prevent uh, ethical misconduct or gender-based violence. It, it depends on an individual based on the awareness that we give the education, the information to, to go to an extent of choosing to be, to be ethical. Uh, I'll, I'll then move to Honorable Mashabela. How many teachers struck off in the past two years? Again, we can send this information to to, to Mr. Brown, uh, uh, once we, 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 we have it, is there, but I don't have the facts at the moment with me. The process of investigating sexual offenses. Obviously, when the, the case is reported to us, we need to make sure that we do investigation first. And that particular investigation will tell us whether do we have a case or not. And the council will then take a decision to say, this one, yes, let's proceed with it. This one, we don't have facts, we don't have evidence. And the ones that we, we, we recommend for disciplinary hearing, obviously will go through that particular process. But however, um, the issues that Honorable Adjuans raised earlier on of saying, this matter is a matter of society, of communities, of everybody, I've indicated in the presentation that parents are selling the soul of their children. I can bet you that 90% of the cases that we are not able to prosecute is as a result of parents that are, that are being bribed, that are hoping that the teachers will marry their children. There was an area in KZN where parents were fighting for their children to be sleeping with, with teachers because of saying, if that happens then they've got a, a better chance of, of 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 making sure that they've got money they, they they can be married by a teacher and and all that so you you've got a bigger issue societal issue that you need to be bringing in the society into the picture to be bringing in children to be bringing in absolutely everyone to make sure that we we fight this pandemic and sketch as a as a collaborative that is why from say's perspective from the parents just before COVID-19 takes over, we were having a structured program that we were visiting churches uh, and, and Methodist was leading in that particular, in that particular program uh, with regard to make sure that we get our communities within that particular space and be able to, to deal with them uh, accordingly. So that's the process that we follow. Uh, in terms of investigating and making sure that disciplinary hearing of those offenses are, are being dealt with. The issue of provincial offices, uh, I think this matter, Chair, we can be in a position to deal with it much better when we come back and report to the committee on our annual report. Currently, we have five out of, well, let me say six because we include how six out of nine provinces that have got says uh, presence and, and visibility. The remaining three with the incoming new council that is being inaugurated by the minister tomorrow will take 
decisions in terms of uh, the three remaining provinces so that by the time their term of office come to an end in the next four years, at least all the provinces have got six offices. Obviously, we do not have the same resources as government. Provincial education, government, Department of Basic Education and Provincial Education Departments might have resources uh, that are appropriated by parliament to be able to deal with uh, having structures and, and human resources across the entire country and be able to deliver services accordingly. Remember, says depends largely on the monthly 15 rents currently that are coming from educators and it would not be possible just to have the nine provinces fully staffed at a go. So, so those are some of the dynamics uh, that, that we, we're finding ourselves in. Uh, again, Honorable Mashabal, I've already uh, talked about the campaigns and plans that we are, we are having with regard to making sure that we, we deter. You can, you can, you can deter and, and also make sure that you, you, you somehow encourage compliance but for me, it's even more than compliance. It's about making sure that I choose to be ethical, to be upholding the ethical standards and maintaining the ethical standards of, of the teaching profession. Uh, the issue that was raised by Honorable Tembegwa, I think has already been uh, responded to. Uh, with regard to the seven-year-old in Soshangubi, again, DG and DDG responded to that matter from our side in terms of SAIS role is to check the extent at which the, the has been or has not been any negligence on the part of the management of the school. And if there is, obviously there are processes that, that we will deal with, but currently there isn't anything that we've picked up uh, in, with regard to that. We will work closely with the Department of uh, education and housing so that we can be in a position to, to, to check those issues. Uh, again, the issue that was raised by Honorable Van der Waal, I think it was responded to. The KZN uh, teacher that you talked about, I'm definitely sure if, if it should be in our books, but again, with regard to sending back feedback through uh, uh, Mr. Brown, we should be able to, to give that feedback if we have that case or not. Uh, I think I've tried to cover all of them. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, DG. I think uh, I was ticking here, Chairperson. They've answered almost everything unless I missed something. So, thank you so much. No, thank you very much, DM and your team. I think as well that the questions have been really adequately responded to. Is there any member who feels that um, she or he is not responded to? None. On that note, I think we let us thank the, the department um, for and says for for both the presentations. And we we hope and trust that like many members have raised that um, the issues of gender based violence are really a second um, pandemic of our country. And all of us, we've got a responsibility, individual or collectively, to also take part and take responsibility, particularly in preventing those that cannot um, prevent themselves, or rather speaking out for them if they cannot really um, speak out. Let me release you then, DM and your team, till next Tuesday. Thank you so much, Chair. And uh, on behalf of the team, education and says we thank you. And we are looking forward to our next interaction. Thanks, Dan.
Llewellyn? Chairperson? Yes, do we have minutes to adopt? I'm, I'm just flighting the first set now. Okay. Okay, um, honorable members, these are the minutes of the 1st of June at 9.30, we had a meeting visually. And uh, the first page you can see is the attendance of uh, members. And the second page of the department, the attendance of the department. And then um, we did the introductions uh, and we welcomed the minister and then uh, and the deputy minister. And then there was an adoption by Honorable Murat Saitla and seconded by Ad Honorable Adwans. Then uh, the DM led the... <laughs> I'm just laughing because of the issue at Honorable Mashabela here. The, the DM led the, the, the discussion um, here and um, the briefing uh, of the third wave was made by Dr. Gustafsson, Dr. Kumalo, and Dr. Whittle. And uh, here is the presentation. And these are the observations from the members. And um, then there were responses uh, by the department. And then we concluded the meeting. And then um, we adopted the minutes of the previous meeting, and then this meeting adjourned at nine past twelve. Any corrections? In absence of corrections, can we adopt the minutes? Chair, yeah, propose adoption. Daisy Rafanaval. Thank you, Honorable Fanaval. Any second? Second, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Adwans. And then we've got the minutes of the 3rd of August. Um, it was also at uh, 9.30 on virtual platform where we had a briefing by DPE, KZN and Gauteng on the um, readiness of school opening, but also on the damages that were caused by the by the unrest in two in two provinces page one is the attendance of members and page two and this meeting was our meeting in the select committee by the way um, and then uh, that's the attendance from dbe the attendance from the Gauteng and kzn uh, provinces and our parliamentary staff. And uh, we opened the meeting and then we were addressed by the minister. Okay, the, the meeting was, okay. and then the department, um, they had made the presentation as DPE. And um, KZN also made a presentation on the vandalized and damaged schools. And Gauteng also did the same. Yeah, Gauteng gave us a lengthy. Uh, those are the observations of the members.
and then those are the responses which were led by the director general and then we concluded uh, the meeting of course with the proposal that we need to go for an oversight which we did last week and then uh, we considered and adopted the minutes and then the meeting then was um adjourned at 10 to 1. can i any reflection on the or corrections rather none can we adopt the minutes I adopt chair. Thank you, Honorable Adwans. Any seconder? I second chair. Thank you very much, chair, Honorable Siwela. Members, this then brings us to the end of this, uh, this meeting. Uh, thank you very much for your participations, your contributions, and for your attendance. Um, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye.